we are back to our first conversation for this morning. Indeed, and so in studio suite with us, we have the uh, folks from over at the Yatche. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I got that wrong, <laughs> but I'll get it. I'll, I'll learn more as we go along. Conservation Trust, uh, and we have in with us the Executive Director, Ms. Christina Garcia, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Thorgay, mm -hmm. who is the Science Program Director, as well as Said Guterres, who is a Protected Areas Program Director. Good morning, good morning good to you, morning. good folks. Yeah. How are we this morning? Excellent. <laughs> Indeed. Excellent. That's a long drive up from well, from PG. <laughs> we had a good sleep, so. Okay. Um, so we're all coming from PG this morning? We came from yesterday. Oh, you okay. came from yesterday. Awesome. Yes. Indeed. Well, we're here to talk about the trust and all the work that you guys have been doing, the wonderful work. So let's, first of all, give our audience a general a view, a general oversight in terms of what is it that this conservation trust is involved in? What are the, th what are the works? Okay, so Yashe has been um, around for a very long time, from since 1998. Our main um, purpose, well, it's a mixture of different things. Protected areas, management is where we focus a lot. Of course, working closely with the Forest Department and the National Biodiversity Office, we manage three protected areas, the Bladen Nature Reserve, which is around 100,000 acres, mm -hmm. um, a private protected area called Golden Stream Corridor Preserve, which is about 15,000 acres, and then you have the Maya Mountain North Forest Reserve, which is about 33,000 acres. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, co-management with the government of Belize, okay. particularly the Forest Department for its management. But apart from protected areas, we do have um, different programs. We mm -hmm. have a community outreach and livelihoods program, which focuses a lot on working with 10 indigenous communities in, in the Toledo district. And what we do is the promotion of smart agricultural practices to these communities. For example, um, promotion of agroforestry, ingali cropping, and of course, beekeeping. So the beekeeping aspect involves women. Mm. Okay. Because for us, we, we have the, uh, a female who is the highest producer in, in honey mm -hmm. um, in the Toledo district. So we promote these smart agricultural practices with these 10 indigenous communities, shifting them from the slash and burn practice that they utilize to a more sustainable one. In this case, the agroforestry, basing it on cacao and also the ingale cropping, which is used for the restoration of soil and of course the beekeeping. How do you manage with um, with moving on a, on a regular, well, I shouldn't say regular basis, but how do you manage uh, maneuvering one particular technique and skill in agriculture to another? What, what has changed in the environment for you to move? Right, so it, it's, it's easier to implement some of these agricultural practices. For example, the cacao agroforestry, you don't have to clear a vast amount of forest to set up an agroforestry plot. You can get, um, high yields within a small confined plot, plot, of, um, plot of land. Mm -hmm. In this case, the farmers, they have traditionally um, planted cacao, so they know about that particular crop and there's a market for it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the ingale cropping is utilized in areas where you have degradation. For example, um, we, we work with a lot of farmers that want to convert, for example, their pasture mm -hmm. into more uh, agroforestry farms. So we utilize the ingale cropping to basically restore the soils for them um, to, you know, have their agroforestry plot or to grow vegetables or in this case beans, corn. Um, so it's easier to kind of make that shift at, 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 the, at the very beginning because like I said, you don't have to clear vast amount of forest mm -hmm. to initiate some of these uh, practices. Yes, um involve themselves with uh, outside or um, research groups that would come in and perhaps test the soil or something? To that yes, area. so apart from the programs, the protected areas management program and the community outreach and livelihoods program, we also have a business arm to the organization called Yaksha Institute for Education and <coughs> Conservation. And within that particular um, aspect, we work with a lot of student groups from abroad. Uh, specifically universities in the US. 
So we bring those university groups um, to work in the protected areas, but also to interact a little bit more with the um, community groups that we work with in the particular community. And they have basically, um, they come with high interest in terms of doing some research and monitoring. And I'm pretty sure Elizabeth mm -hmm. will speak about that mm -hmm. a little bit later on. But their interaction has been very uh, focused and has helped us a lot in terms of gathering data and information that we utilize for decision making. I wanted to jump a bit into protect the protected areas management aspect of it mm -hmm. uh, and what does that entail? Uh, how do you go about uh, protecting and, and safe keeping this vast amount of land? Yeah. Well, it's, it's no small feat. I would imagine really. so. We, so we have three protected areas, two that we co-manage with the government and one that is privately managed mm -hmm. by the organization. And we're, we're all talking about thousands of acres. Yeah. Um, so we have, we, under the protected areas program, we have a, a team of rangers mm -hmm. from the nearby communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's essential to, you know, have the support from those nearby communities. And that's where we we hire uh, our guys from mm -hmm. and some of them are previous like hunters that they they've stopped doing that a long time ago um, some of them are just really young and interested in this kind of work and <coughs> they want to get into it um, but we have this team that is dedicated to going into the protected area conducting patrols on a daily basis year-round um, and, and that's how we we try as best as we can um, the challenge there is the number of people that we have. Right. Boots on the ground mm -hmm. can be a challenge, mm -hmm. not just to keep them, but to also um, ensure that they're covering ground uh, where they should be. Um, they have to focus on specific uh, hotspot areas, mm -hmm. and that's what kind of drives where and how we move around. Because I, I, I would imagine it must be strategic movement mm -hmm. Uh, through these areas, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that you may not be able to cover every square inch, per yeah. se. Yeah. The, the intention is not to cover every square inch, because it's nearly impossible. It is. So even if you had uh, 100 guys on the ground, it, it really doesn't make sense to send uh, mm -hmm. the guys to cover all the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, really and truly has to do with human behavior, so we know you know, more or less when hunters are going out. Uh, if, the, if the moon, uh, is, if it's a full moon, you're not expecting hunters to be out hunting. And mm -hmm. so you kind of time it based on that. Um, we're, we're always, a, as, a, as a species, we're always looking for the path of least resistance. Yeah. So we'll go uh, in the valleys, we'll, we'll look for trails that are already in existence, roads that are already in existence. And so we also target those areas. Too. So what are, what are rangers looking for in terms of the different infractions or uh, the, the, the different illegal activities? What is it that they're looking yeah. for? Yeah, so primarily looking for signs that people have been in there. Mm -hmm. uh, something as simple as boot prints on the ground, you tend to find that often. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we look into our database, and you look at infractions, legal entry into the protected area tends to be pretty high okay. because often that's all you find, you know, mm -hmm. boot prints. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a hunter that's been in there and perhaps it's his first time, they will have machete uh, marks on, on trees just marking their, their path. And that's kind of how they get into, um, into the protected area. So the rangers are trained to look um, for those signs. Um, trash people you know take their chips back and they just leave it on the trail our guys will pick that up uh, we know where um, we sometimes try to figure out more or less where it comes from especially in far reaches of the protected areas like the blade and nature reserve when you start having transboundary incursions um, the trash that you find tends to be from products that you can find across the border so mm -hmm. Guatemalan products and that's how we can you know put one one and one together and then we know for a fact that people from across the border have been in those areas. Are, are these the only challenges you've faced oh, no. uh, in recent times? Yeah. We're talking about hunting, uh, littering. Uh, yeah, what it, else? I, well, hunting is one of the most prevalent. Okay. Um, you, you can't get rid of it. It's been there. It, all we could do is try to minimize the impact of it. Yeah. 
Um, another, another really important one that we try to avoid or minimize is illegal logging. Like mm -hmm. This is one of the things that, particularly within the forest reserves, mm -hmm. uh, in Belize, uh, like our forest reserves are established for the exploitation of the resources. So uh, timber, the main product that comes out of the forest reserves. And in the Maya Mountain North Forest Reserve, we have uh, an area that can be accessed fairly easy because it's flat, and then the rest is very rugged, hilly terrain. And, but within this flat area is where people can access it easily, and so we've been seeing a lot uh, of logging instances in, in the last couple of years. I know probably COVID had something to do with uh, the economics of the local communities, and so We've seen a spike in, in illegal logging, so people go in, cut one, two trees, take it out, usually at night. Mm -hmm. um, our guys can't always function at night, so it's, you know, those are the, the challenges that we have. Catching people in the act is probably one of the hardest things to do. Um, so you, you discussed having that collaboration with the government in order for you all to continue doing your, um, your research and your, um, your advocacy, but uh, what separates, and I, this is something I think that I want to know and I think some, some viewers would like to know, what separates the work that Yashe is doing um, from other nature conservation um, organizations? What separates Yashe from PA, for example? Yeah, so the Protected Areas Conservation Trust has been more of a partner mm -hmm. for many co-managers in the country because they basically provide the finances to have boots on the ground, mm -hmm. to do the enforcement, to do the research and, and monitoring. Um, there are many organizations that have a lot of the same goals and objectives in, in, in place. Mm -hmm. In the case of Yaksha, we go more by the vision of harmony between nature and human development for the benefit of both. Mm -hmm. We understand our goal in terms of, um, of conservation, mm -hmm. of protected areas management, but we also do realize that we need to balance that and create livelihoods opportunities mm -hmm. for communities. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what makes Yaksha a little bit unique from other organizations in, in yeah. Belize, that we sh try to strike that balance between conservation and of course enhancing livelihoods. How do you, um, how do you bring that, that connection and that balance with um, traditional knowledge systems. So for example, the hunting, um, mm -hmm. you know, some will argue with you and say, but this is tradition, tradition. this is a part of my, my livelihood. How do you, how do you come construct that balance between community and that's, that's pretty hard. I think um, the, the best way you could tackle this is through education and awareness. Um, and of course the enforcement work or uh, patrols kind of complement it. Mm -hmm. But it's important to bring out the message to the communities um, yes, we understand it's tradition. Um, oftentimes it's illegal. In, if you're going by the books, what's in the law, most of uh, the people who are hunting out there, it's being done illegally. Either they don't have a hunting permit uh, or they do have a per permit, but they're in the wrong place mm -hmm. um, at the wrong time because you're not supposed to hunt at night, but everyone hunts at night. Um, or they don't have any of those, no permit, and they just go in um, oftentimes with uh, on an unlicensed firearm or to just borrow their neighbor's, neighbor's shotgun and they go ahead and do it. So I, I think the education component is trying to address that. That yes, you can, we're not saying you shouldn't hunt, uh, do it wisely. The resources are, uh, they're finite. At mm -hmm. some point they'll run out. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to continue doing it, perhaps um, want your kids and your grandkids to, to do it in the future, then you have to do the right thing. There's ways in which you know, it can be done. And so part of the education has to be, um, how can we tell people where to go to? Because oftentimes they may not know where to go to for a permit, mm -hmm. um, or they may not know the seasons, the breeding seasons for certain species. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of key in terms of preserving uh, species for, for a longer period of time. So if you, if you kill a pregnant, uh, deer, for example, then you know you're you're reducing the chances of, of that population to persist for a longer time. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think education is, is very is key, and, and it is one of the mm -hmm. components of our community and outreach 
uh, program. Um, it is kind of kind of the half livelihoods is one, then education and awareness is another one. So we've been focusing a lot on human connectivity, human balance with nature, and these are things that, for the most part, humans can control to a to a for yeah. lack of a better word, other humans in in certain aspect with laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. But what about the aspects that are not human that are very much from out of your control, fire risk, deforestation, and so forth. How do you, as Yasha, manage that then? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great question. And fire risk is something that we are dealing with every dry season. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Bladen Nature Reserve, which is adjacent to a large savanna. That's the Deep River Forest Reserve. And so that burns consistently every year. So what we have done is actually we've trained our, our staff, our ranger team, and our extension officers uh, to handle all the fire tools, to be able to um, like put in the fire breaks um, so that when there's a threat of fire, we're able to kind of keep it from spreading any farther. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we do is that we uh, train members of the community who wish to practice slash and burn, so we allow them to access our tools mm -hmm. so that they can you know, control their fire on their farms and then it reduces the chance that that would spread. Do we lose forests during these fires? It has happened. Uh, we've had some fires in recent years burning uh, from the roadside into the Golden Stream Corridor Preserve. Um, because I don't know if you've seen a map of that protected area, but the Southern Highway like bisects yeah. the reserve. So the reserve is on the north and to the south of the highway. And oh. yeah, regularly we will see like trash burning on the side of the road and then we right. will have to go and out it. So there are yeah. some human factors to these fires. Is it mainly uh, human contributing to these fires. I don't know. Somebody throws a cigarette bud. Somebody lights a trash. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know there is some explanations that it's just the heat from the sun as well. Would you delve a bit into how these fires are started, how they're caused, what causes them? I think for the m most part, um, the fires that I've witnessed over the last few years have been mostly human caused. Yeah. But there is a risk too that lightning strikes, uh, yeah. especially in the savanna and the dry season, could could cause a fire there as well. So talk to us um, about the restoration that Yasha does when it comes to these ways. Yeah, so as Syed was talking about a few minutes ago, illegal logging is an issue, and especially in the Maya Mountain North Forest Reserve. Um, so we actually have a few areas of that reserve that have been cleared um, <coughs> for agriculture and selectively logged as well. Um, and there is one particular spot that's about six acres. It's very large along the boundary line uh, where several uh, ranger patrols were able to encounter the individual in the area. And jointly with the forest department, uh, we brought the case to court and it was you know, successfully prosecuted. And so we were reasonably uh, confident that the area was secure. And we started to go back last year and replant that clearing. So when you when you hear an instance like uh, six acres being cleared for agricultural land, the question is, how is it that these perpetrators were able to do that uh, without being detected yeah. until six acres uh, had been cleared? Yeah, yeah, that that's that's part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we have the people they they scout the area. Um, when we're not around, and they, okay. there's always someone watching you, so don't ever think that they're they're not watching you when you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> so they they know more or less where um, mm. areas of land are good for agriculture, right? So, and so they they would tend to go out several times, scout the area, and in this particular instance that she's talking about, we um, we ended up finding it by looking at satellite imagery um, around March. And the imagery was like near real time, just a couple of days from, from when the clearings had happened. And so we sent out a team to verify um, where this was. And lo and behold, we found this clearing. Um, and there was this uh, private property at the boundary line of the reserve. Okay. Uh, it's like an orange orchard. Mm -hmm. And there was a strip of forest that was left in between the boundary line and the actual clearing. So you, mm -hmm. when, when you walk the, the boundary line of the, the orchard, all you see is just trees. But mm -hmm. just like 
50 meters in, then there's this clearing. six to eight uh, it's, acre it's clearing. Like, it's That's like the options are... smart, actually. Well, you know, yeah. of any criminal, yes. Yes. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah it's any criminal would find ways to circumvent the system to try and get away with their crime. But then this is where I find it interesting that, you know, if you were just scouting the, the perimeter with boots on the ground, you wouldn't really notice that mm. something was clear because you said exactly. it was satellite mm -hmm. imagery. So you, you have to combine as many tools as you can. And mm -hmm. so satellite imagery is just one of the, the tools that we use. Um, of course, our guys are out there. They, they use a regular um, phone, but they're like rugged phones so that they, they resist the, the wear and tear of being out there. And so they have an app called Smart, uh, which they use to document all the information. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's for what they can see while they're on patrol. So the, the stuff that they cannot see um, is what we're trying to build on. Um, so improving on technology using satellite imagery. Um, the use of drones is something that is fairly new to us, but we're starting to, um, to use it uh, more and more, not just to, for detection, but also for assessments of damages whenever we, we encounter, so encounter them. So Yashe has... Uh particular parameters, right, where you guys um, focus mostly your work in. Um, are there any other areas with your partners that, for example, if it's in, something happens in Orange Walk or in the north, that your partners are not able to get to, will Yashe be able to assist? Yeah, so we have um, certain expertise within the organization and um, other partner organizations have tapped into that expertise, like for example, fire management. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was prior to the, well, during the pandemic, there was an outbreak in terms of fire yeah. in the Benke area, Vaca Forest Reserve. Mm -hmm. Yaksha was able to assist um, a group in Benke to basically help suppress um, the fire within that area. So yeah, there are areas that we have loan expertise to other organizations. Mm -hmm. That's good. Very nice. I know we have a lot more to cover and I do want to get into that citizen science <coughs> symposium. Um, but let's go into the, um, the propagation trails a little bit, Beth. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit more about what that is and what Yashi is doing? Yeah, definitely. So in the Maya Mountain North Forest Reserve, um, we did some surveys to look for 10 species of trees that we knew were either threatened or rare mm -hmm. or were uh, valuable for timber mm -hmm. um, because these are the species that we are, you know, they have the most pressing need to be conserved, especially in the forest reserve where it could be logged, mm -hmm. right? So we, we needed to have more information about where these populations were located and their size and kind of the, the age of the trees themselves. Um, so we, we did some extensive field work on the ground to do those surveys and uh, established where the populations were located. And then after that, we actually monitored the trees regularly to collect seeds, and we grew those trees in our nursery. So Yashe does have a nursery at Golden Stream, um, and we use it uh, to you know, grow cacao that we give to farmers, and inga, and all of the types of trees that they use for the sustainable agriculture, but we also use it for restoration project type of works. Uh, so. And from the nursery, these trees are replanted back yes. across the reserve. Yeah, exactly. And so um, several of the species that we were interested in targeting, because they were rare, they just hadn't been studied very well to know the best practices for growing them. Mm -hmm. So we actually did do some experiments to try different, different things like different lighting conditions or different types of soil, mm -hmm. um, different uh, treatments before planting the seed to see if we could break the dormancy of the seed itself mm -hmm. and encourage it to germinate even better. So, we are documenting all of that information in the process. So now we're in that phase of planting. <laughs> all right, well, there's a lot more to <laughs> a cover. A lot more to cover. And we, before we continue, we, though, we have to take a very short break. And we'll be back with more Yashay. Yeah,